Well, there's a lot of people that are enjoying the snow, and um, they're staying at home with Pastor Pillow and um, Bedside Assembly, so we're going to pray for them today, right, that God will just convict them of their sin and bring them to church. <laughs> I pray in the name of Jesus, they will not rest until they get here. <laughs> but you're here. Wow, you're looking good today. Uh, we have a, a good friend here that's been with us, I think, 17, 18 months, David Wilbanks uh, from Tennessee. Would you stand, David? And this is his last Sunday with us. We love you, David. Why don't you just stretch your hands towards him. Lord, as we send him out, as he goes home to Tennessee, we pray the blessing of God upon him. We pray, Lord, that you will just guide him and strengthen him and prosper him. Lord, we just are so thankful for his life, and we send him out in the blessing and the peace of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 God is so good. Praise the Lord. You know, uh, there's a scripture in Proverbs 3, and it tells us that we need to honor the Lord by giving him the first part, not the last part, of all of our income. And then he will fill our barns with wheat and barley, and he will overflow your wine vats with the finest wines. Isn't that something? Now, if you put this in modern-day vernacular, their barns were their bank accounts, and that's where they kept all their wealth. And God said, test me in this and see if I, if I prove me. If you give me the first part, the first 10% of all your income, and just see what happens. I'm going to fill your barns with such abundant crops that you'll be better off afterwards than you did before you made the commitment. And we always tell people, we say the clear teaching of God's word is this, that you will be better off tithing. Do it for six months. Don't miss a time. Don't miss a paycheck. Don't miss any income. Give God the first 10%. And after six months, if you are not satisfied, we'll give you your money back. <laughs> How about that? I'm telling you what, I, I, you know who I learned that from? John Maxwell. Anybody ever hear about John Maxwell? And he challenged us uh, pastors about eight years ago to do that. And he says, you know what? In all the years of ministry, I've never had one person take me up on that. Not one. He says, because if they will do it consistently for six months, they will be so blessed and they'll see God come through for them in miraculous provision. And they will, they will be blessed. Amen. And he says, uh, he's never had anybody in all the years of ministry that he's been in ministry. So I thought, boy, that's a pretty good idea. And so I started giving the challenge, and people started coming through, and God started blessing them in supernatural ways. Hallelujah. So we're going to bring our tithes and offerings. Um, remember your breakthrough offerings. Also, uh, I'm giving on my app. Aren't you glad that we have many ways that you can give? There's even, uh, you can give by texting. And I got it all in here. And I got all logged in, complete gift. I got her done. Aren't you proud of me? All right. It says, thank you. You're welcome. Lord, we just give you the praise for your goodness today. Thank you, Lord, that we can be faithful in our tithes and offerings. And not only that, we give you glory because you are worthy of it all. We worship you through our tithes and offerings. It's not a religious ritual. It's an act of worship. Because we love you, God, and we give you praise and honor and thank you for your goodness in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. amen. Well, if you're going to pray, you might as well have a good prayer life. Can I hear an amen? Yeah. Do you want your prayers to work? Do you want your prayers to be effective? Do you want to uh, allow God to do supernatural things in your life? We want to talk about prayer one more time, and I'm going to uh, talk to you this morning about a certain principle that I've learned from God's Word that really, really set me free in my prayer life, and the name of it is the short accounts principle. It's the idea that uh, in your relationship with God, you must keep short accounts. Whenever that you're aware that you have sinned or fallen short in your relationship with God, you admit it. You repent, you go to God, you get the blood to cleanse whatever uh, the failure is. And then when you come to God, you can come to him with extreme confidence in your heart because you know you're right with God. There's no feeling in the whole world like knowing your heart is right with God. 
And when you know you're right with God, you have confidence towards God. And you know that he is answering your prayers. It's just a spiritual element of prayer that is so vitally important. Um, I remember many times talking with people over the years, and they said, well, God is sovereign, and sometimes he says yes, and sometimes he says no, and we never know what God will do. And sometimes, and I believe in the sovereignty of God, but sometimes that is used as, a, um, as an excuse so that people do not take personal responsibility for the condition of their own heart. Um, turn in your Bibles to Psalms 66. Psalm 66, this is David, a man after God's own heart, one of the greatest rulers of the nation of Israel. He made many, many mistakes. He sinned against God in many horrible ways. But I'm so thankful for God's grace. This gives us all hope. All of us can be forgiven. Aren't you glad for that? No matter where you've been and what you've done, all of us can be forgiven. This is what David said in Psalm 66, verse 18. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. The word regard, it means to treasure, build a wall around an iniquity and hide it in the deepest corner of your heart and hope no one sees it and you don't think about it, you don't talk about it, you don't expose it to yourself or to others or to God, you regard iniquity in your heart. And David said, when I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. However, verse 19, but verily God has heard me, he has attended to the voice of my prayer, blessed be God, which has not turned away from my prayer, nor has he turned his mercy away from me. Now David committed a vile sin, a horrible sin. He committed uh, adultery with Bathsheba. And Bathsheba was one of the generals, uh, general's wife in the Israeli army. And uh, it was a horrible sin. And then to cover up his sin, he sent Uriah into the front lines of the battle so he would be killed. And then Bathsheba, who was committing adultery with the king, and then the king has her husband killed. Now her husband is dead, and he goes out and he takes, his, takes Bathsheba as his own wife. I'm going to know that's not quite right. I'm going to know that's not at all right. And uh, you can read in Psalms 32 what happened to David when he covered up his sin. For quite a while, he kept it under, uh, in, a, in a dark place in his heart, and the horrible consequences of that. Look at verse one of Psalms uh, 32. This is what it says in the Living Bible. What happiness for those whose guilt has been forgiven. What joys when sins are covered over with the blood of Christ is what he's talking about. What relief for those who have confessed their sins and God has completely cleared their record. There was a time when I wouldn't admit what a sinner I was, but my dishonesty made me miserable and filled my days with frustration. All day and all night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength evaporated like water on a sunny day until I finally admitted all my sins to you, God, and I stopped trying to hide them. How many know God's aware of them whether you try to hide them or not? And he always knows where you're at and what you're thinking and what you're doing. You can't hide anything from God. And he says, I stopped trying to hide my sins. I said to myself, I will confess my sins to the Lord. And then you forgave me. And now all my guilt is gone. Woohoo! What a great way to live, right? When all your guilt is gone, when your heart is right with God, how many know that there are no perfect people in the world? Isn't the good news of the gospel is all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But thank God for Jesus that he died on the cross and if we will confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from how much unrighteousness? All unrighteousness. And when you're forgiven, you're forgiven. Amen? 
How many know it feels good to be clean on the inside? You're not hiding nothing. You, you're just right with God. You're right with your family. You're right with people. You've made you, your accounts. You've settled your accounts. And you have confidence towards God. And when you pray, you know God is hearing you because you're praying with a confident heart. So this is powerful. It's a powerful truth. As a Christian, you're only as strong as your prayer life. It's so true. If you've got a strong prayer life, I'm telling you, you are transcending all the trials and the difficulties that life throws your way. If you do not have a good prayer life, difficulties and trials begin to overwhelm you. Now, it's not a matter of when, if trials come, it's a matter when they come. How many know you're always going to face trials and tribulations and difficulties and doubts and fears no matter how long you live? It's just the way life is. But when you develop a deep prayer life, you have a connection with God, you are able to transcend those trials and difficulties. Not only that, your obstacles and your doubts and your fears, you're able to rise above them because you are one with God and you get a God-like perspective and you get a God-like energy and you get a God-like strength to rise above. Woohoo! I studied, the Lord had me study for about a year all the great ministries of the past three, 400 years, and I read about their lives, and I studied the difficulties they went through and what they accomplished. And you know what? There was one reoccurring theme in every one of them. These men and women of God, they had deep prayer lives. And because they developed their prayer lives, nothing could stop them. Disappointments couldn't stop them. Circumstances couldn't stop them. They always would rise above. How many like that word transcend? Isn't that a good word? I love to rise above. God's calling us to rise above. Our spring conference here in May, and I encourage you to come with Billy Burke, one of the greatest healing ministries in this entire nation, and Bobby Connor. It's gonna be an awesome, awesome conference. But I was praying about the theme, and the Lord said, soaring above. How many wanna soar higher? You want to soar above the difficulties and the trauma and the worries and the tribulations of the time. And you can when you are connected to Jesus in a deep prayer life. Yesterday, Julie and I were traveling, and uh, Julie says, look, in this big tree right next to us, she says, look at all those big birds. And we got closer and closer and closer, and they were eagles, seven of them in one tree. I've never seen that in all my life. Isn't that awesome? Wow, seven bald eagles. I thought, God, you are talking to us. You want us to soar higher. You want us to transcend. You want us to get above it. You can't when you don't have a prayer life. As a Christian, when you have a strong prayer life, you are strong, you are victorious, you are joyful, you are effective, your prayers get answered. You're living above the circumstances, not under the circumstances. Amen? People say, how you doing? Well, I'm pretty good under the circumstances. What are you doing under there anyway? Get out from underneath there and get on top of those things. The only way you can do that is through your relationship with God. When you have a weak prayer life, you're a weak Christian. You're defeated. You're sad. You're perplexed by everything. You don't know which way is up. I'm telling you what, God has answers for you. Aren't you glad God talks to you through this book? Aren't you glad he talks to you through his spirit? Aren't you glad that he's a living, dynamic, loving God who wants to lead you and guide you and instruct you and teach you and help you? Hallelujah. <laughs> That's why prayer is so vitally important. I love this verse, John 16, 24. I'm telling you, when you read this verse, I want you to take it at face value. How many will take it at face value? Are you ready? Here it is. This is Jesus. He's talking to you personally. He's looking you in the eye. This is what he says. Ask. And what? We'll see. Maybe. I'll think about it. I'll get back to you later. What did he say? Ask and you shall receive. And then what happens? That your Joy, maybe. How many know God wants you to live a good life, a happy life, a joyful life? 
in spite of your circumstances, in spite of your challenges, in spite of all those things that are going on around you at work and the difficulties you face, God says you can live above it. You can be a joyful Christian because you're connected to God and he loves you and he answers your prayers and he meets the very desires of your heart because he's a good God. He's a good, good father. I love what Dean Niferata says. He says, the work of the church is prayer. The reward you receive for doing the work is ministry. It's so true. As I traveled to Romania, as I traveled to India, Uruguay, uh, Argentina, um, all over the world, many times I've been out of the nation and visited some of the greatest uh, works of the Holy Spirit on the face of the earth. And you know what the recurring theme is? These people are bathed in prayer. And ministry flows effortlessly out of a life of prayer. And when you know God and you love God and he loves you and you're built up in his spirit, then you find out that ministry is not difficult. I like what uh, Paul Bilheimer said in his book, Destined for the Throne. He says, a church without a massive well-run prayer program is simply, that's quite a mouthful, is simply operating a religious treadmill. Did I tell you about my hamsters? Did I tell you about my hamster? I was in business. At age nine and 10, I went into business with two hamsters. And uh, within a year, year or so, I had 91 hamsters. 16 day gestation period. And uh, we couldn't afford all the cages, so we built them. And then we couldn't afford their exercise wheels, so we built them. Hamsters are nocturnal. Everybody say nocturnal. That means they're up all night running on that stupid treadmill. (laughs) And because we made them, they squeak, 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 squeak. We had 12 to 14 cages downstairs, and all these hamsters, squeak, 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 squeak. Can you imagine that? My sister had to sleep down there. I slept upstairs. (laughs) But I'm telling you what, those stupid hamsters would run their brains out. (laughs) Run, 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 run. And every time they got done for the night, they were in the same place they were. That's the picture of the church without prayer. Busy, busy, active, active. that, That is the picture of the Christian home without being centered on prayer. You're gonna work, work, work. What do you get? You're going to work your fingers to the bone. What do you get? Bony fingers, right? Work, work, work. Got to work on this marriage. Got to work on these kids. Got to work, 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 work. I got to work, 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 work. What if we would focus on knowing God first in our home and in our family and our marriage with our... Do you think God would provide wisdom so that we would not be on the treadmill any longer? We'd start going forward? Hallelujah. I love this scripture. God talked to me and he says, you know what? So many people in America have committed two evils. They have abandoned me, the fountain of living water, and they have carved out their own cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. Jesus is the living water. He's saying, come to me and drink. Drink of me. You're gonna find joy. You're gonna find life. You're gonna find happiness. You're gonna find strength. You're gonna find answers. You're gonna find energy. You're gonna find a new perspective. You're gonna find what you need when you drink of me. But he says, no, people are too busy. They have their own cisterns, the cistern of entertainment, of education, of job creation, of money, other relationships, other sometimes even substance abuses. They got all these wells they're drinking out, but those wells are broken. Wells, the water is polluted. That's why God wants us to meet with him every day. That's why we prioritize the house of God every week. That's why we meet with other Christians on a regular basis. Why? We're drinking of Jesus, amen? And I'm telling you what, when you drink of him, every need that you need will be provided for you. What is living water? Let me ask you that. What is living water? Living water is something that all of us need. You cannot survive a day or two or three without water. You can survive 40 days without food, but you can't survive more than two, three, four days without water. Jesus is saying, I am the living water. I am your source of life. I am what you really need. Develop a relationship with me. You're gonna find what you really need. Don't create your own cisterns that are broken. Wow, God forgive us, amen? This is what Samuel said 
the prophet Samuel, God forbid that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you. And I thought, isn't that something? I believe the greatest sins in the church are number one, unforgiveness and bitterness, and number two, prayerlessness. If we could get over those two hurdles, what could God do for us and in us? I want to give you some principles of effective prayer, and I'm going to close out this message. We talked about this a couple of weeks ago, knowing God first. You got to yada God, you got to yada, amen? You got to be intimate with God. You got to know Jesus. You got to be intimate with him. Genesis 4, 1, and Adam, yada, his wife Eve, and she conceived and bare a son. Oh, God says, if you're going to glory in anything, glory in the fact that you yada God, you're intimate with God. You're going to bear fruit when you're intimate with God. So it's the no God first principle. And then Pastor Ed talked about the stay filled principle. Go to Jesus and drink and drink and drink and soak in his presence and live in his presence and be in his presence. And I'm telling you what, you're going to Stay full of God and everything that you need is going to be given to you and everything that others need is going to flow out of you. Out of you are going to flow rivers of miracles and living water. But the third principle is the short account principle. Look at this verse. This is hard hitting. Proverbs 28, 9. He that turns away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer will be repulsive to me, says God. Another translation says it this way. If you plug your ears when I'm talking, I'll plug my ears when you're talking. That's pretty simple, isn't it? How many know that the lordship of Jesus Christ is the crux of the entire Christian life? Do you really know God? Do you really hear his voice? Do you really follow him? He's Lord, I'm not. And somebody says, I don't hear from God. All you gotta do is pick up the Bible and start reading. All you got to do is just wait on him in prayer. Pray in the spirit for a while and worship him and listen. Pretty soon ask him a question. Pretty soon he's going to give you words by his spirit. How many know God talks? And if he talks to you and you don't obey, and the problem is a lot of times God gives me stuff to do in the Bible and by his spirit that I don't want to do. You all look so holy out there. You're like, can you believe this pastor? He's just... How many of you, 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 you admit it might be a little bit that way in your life too? Okay, three of you, good, good, four. You know, there's so much stuff that God tells me that my flesh says no. My spirit is willing, but my flesh is weak, right? And I know I oughta, but I don't wanna. But... I know this principle that if I start saying no when God talks to me, he's going to start saying no when I pray. I don't want that. I want to have an open heaven because I'm going to need some answers to prayer. How about you? (laughs) Look at this. Uh, We looked at that scripture Here's three life-changing truths, and I'm going to give them to you in the next five minutes. Boy, we are really getting done today, aren't we? This is awesome. I guess I could go into part two of this message. What do you think? I got lots of time. Okay. Uh, No, I'll be done here in about 10, 15 minutes. But when I was meditating on this truth, the short accounts principle, God gave me three things to give to you. They will absolutely change your life if you apply them. In the word of God, God has supernatural solutions. The problem is we don't apply what he tells us to do. The second thing is, it's not easy to do it. And thirdly, you never master it where you don't have to work at it. We're all a work in progress. We all got issues. Some of us have subscriptions. <laughs> but these are, these are three golden gems. These are worth more to you than a million dollars. You say, why? Because if you can pray and get an answer and your prayers will be answered, how many know that's worth a lot of money? So I want to know how to pray and get an answer. I want to know how to be effective in my, in, in my prayer life. Here's the first one. It's found in 1 Peter 3, 7. Uh, you can turn there if you want. But this is the principle. If I dishonor others, my prayers will be hindered. 
God says, in a marriage relationship, you and your spouse inherit God's grace together as a unit. And if you dishonor one another in that relationship, your prayers will be hindered. Because you receive grace together, and if there's a division or there's a wedge between the two of you, there's dishonor between the two of you, it's going to be hard to get your prayers answered. Now, how many of you are like Julie and I, we've been married uh, 30, help me out here, 30-ish years. (laughs) Thank you, dear. (laughs) <laughs> Thank you, Pastor Justin. I owe you one, man. 30-ish years. And we've never had a fight. <laughs> now, we've had some strong disagreements, some intense <laughs> disagreements, some intense fellowship. <laughs> Uh, But if you live that close one to another that many years, you're going to have some stuff. Amen? That's just the way life is. But did you know, this is what I struggle with, and maybe some of you struggle with it too. There's a difference between disagreeing and being dishonoring. And I'm still learning that. You know, when, when you are put together with your spouse and you find out that you come from different backgrounds, you have different value systems, you're different genders, you're motivated differently, you view life differently, you get your needs met and you have different needs in your, right? How many know there's going to be some conflict there? And sometimes it might get really heated conflict. But here's the deal. If you disagree, and you disagree agreeably, you're okay. But if you disagree disagreeably and dishonor one another, you're in trouble because now God won't even hear your prayers. Now, that's a heavy revy. I don't know what that means, but that's what I heard when I was growing up. Whenever my dad, who was a pastor, would say something, they'd say, that's a heavy revy. But how many want an open heaven no matter what? What does it mean to honor your spouse? It means that even if you do have times of disagreement with them, you respect them as entirely valuable and a gift from God. Can you do that? You you make a choice to esteem them as valuable, a gift from God. This is a treasure that God has given me. And we have disagreements, but we're going to work those out. We're going to communicate, but we're going to do it in the right spirit, in the right attitude, and we're going to honor one another even if we disagree on certain things. Because then I can pray and God's going to hear my prayers. Now, did you know that you can even treat your children dishonorably? even though discipline is necessary, but to dishonor them at the same time at dis- as disciplining, that's going overboard and that's wrong. And I've had to repent to my kids so many times. I sent Samuel over to Video Cafe today because I said, I don't want to look you in the eye, guy. You go over there for now because uh, uh, dad's going to preach and hit home today. But the truth is, it's so easy for me to enforce discipline in a dishonoring way, and I have to repent before God. When you lead a church and you have leaders and you have differences of opinions, you have conflicts, sometimes you can disagree with leaders. But I'm always praying, God, help me to honor the men and women you have given to serve with me. No matter if we come from different backgrounds, if we do it right, we can stay under the blessing of heaven. Did you know the devil's scheme for the church is division? You know what division is? Divided vision. Part of the group goes one way, the other group goes this way. Divided vision. How many know the devil loves that and God hates it? But if we can honor one another, we can work out our differences. And not only that, but when we pray, God hears us. (laughs) That's fun when God hears your prayers. And even though, because he doesn't expect you to agree with everybody all the time. But he does expect you to treat them honorably. 
How many see the difference? How many see that? Secondly is this. Understand that all of us have the potential to sin. Turn over to 1 John chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1, verses 6 through 10. Oh, hallelujah. God is good. This is what it says. It says, if we say that we have fellowship with God and walk in darkness, we lie and we do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another in the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar. His word is not in us. Now, how many are glad that when you came to Jesus, that his righteousness was imputed to your account? Amen? Are you glad that Jesus took the judgment for your sin so that his righteousness becomes yours as a believer? That's the clear teaching of the word of God. It's been imputed to your account. So when God looks at my account in heaven, he sees the blood of Jesus and the righteous life of Jesus imputed to my account. That's why whenever in the epistles, they wrote the epistles in the New Testament, they always wrote them to the saints that were at Corinth, to the saints that were at Thessalonica, to the saints that were at Colossae. Did you know that our address has changed and our identity has changed? Our, <coughs> our address, we have been made to be seated with Christ in heavenly places, amen? And our identity changes. We are the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ. We are saints of the most high God, amen? Amen. Now, once we establish that, we have to be careful because even though we're saints, sometimes we sin. And if we think we've come to the point that we don't sin anymore, we're in trouble. Look at this. Verse six, if we say that we have fellowship with God and we walk in darkness, we lie. What is that talking about? It's talking about living your life in such a way that you are accountable to nobody and you have hidden sins in your life that you don't want anybody to know about. You never talk about them. You never talk to God about them. You offend certain people or uh, you, you harm certain people and you never talk to them and you never, you never make it right. And so then you come to church and you say, hallelujah, I love you, Jesus. I have fellowship with God. I'm in the light, but really in your heart, you're in darkness. I mean, oh, that's a serious thing. We gotta get that right. So what do we do? We tell God, I'm gonna tell the truth about my heart condition. And I'm so glad that God is merciful. Aren't you glad? Have any of you promised God that you wouldn't blow it and you blew it again? Nobody here. That's happened to me many times. That's happened to me many, many times. <laughs> and some of you go stand up and say, sinner! <laughs> because we're human. Aren't you glad that God is there again to receive us if our heart is right and our, we're sincere? Religion says you've got to meet a suit and code, and if you don't meet that code, we're going to kick you out. Christianity says, Jesus did it all. Come and receive grace to live right. Amen? Grace to think right. Grace to live right. Grace to change. Come receive the blessing. All that God is saying is come out of darkness, walk in the light, and tell the truth. Tell the truth. You know, when I throw a fit and my family sees me act goofy, and in my pride I want to just keep it to myself, and the Lord says, they know you're goofy the way you acted. You might as well admit it. Because if you deny that you did it, you're going to offend them. But if you tell them the truth that it was goofy and it was wrong, then they'll respect you. So I could go back to my family and say, Dad, you know, that little fit I threw, that, that wasn't really right. <laughs> what, Dad? <laughs> And that shouldn't have done that. What? <laughs> All right, I shouldn't have done it. <laughs> Are you happy now? <laughs> but you know, 
that's how you get exalted in God's eyes. You, you humble yourself. You tell the truth about your sin. You keep yourself accountable. Amen? How many know that if you're struggling with alcohol, you probably shouldn't live across the street from the biggest bar in town? Isn't that right? You know, if you're watching the wrong movies, you probably should get rid of HBO out of your home. Is that right? Maybe you need to empty that liquor cabinet. Little eyes are watching. How are you living? What are you doing? Amen? How many know that when you get close to God, it's not always picnic time? A lot of time it's purging time. And again, we're not legalistic in this church and say you can do this and you can't watch that and you're not gonna do this, but I'm telling you what, you get close to God and he'll clean you up little by little. And it's not gonna be a legalistic church that cleans you up, it's gonna be a loving Jesus that cleans you up. Isn't that right? Pretty soon you start feeling bad about certain things you're saying and doing and places you're going and friends you have and ways you treat your family, ways you treat your spouse, ways you treat this and that, and God starts dealing with you when you go to praise, and now what about that? And if I don't deal with it the next time I pray, my confidence level in prayer is gone. So I gotta walk in the light. Everybody say, walk in the light. Amen. Don't you think that's good? Somebody says, well, I don't like to go to small groups because people are going to know my stuff. Well, how many know people ought to know your stuff? At least some of it. So they can pray for you and support you and you can walk in the light. Walking in the light is not walking in perfection. It's walking in transparency. It's walking in honesty. It's walking in truthfulness. It's presenting who we really are to other people, warts and all. Amen. I'm glad I came to church today, aren't you, Judy? Amen. All those people that stayed home, they're missing it today. Would you do me a favor, Judy? Tell them to get the tape. Tell them the tape. <laughs> Tell them to go on the app. <laughs> Get the tape. Can you believe that? Where did that come from? 1952 or something. <laughs> Get the tape, y'all. All right. Are you ready for number three? Uh, we're just about done here. Yeah, we're just about done. Get you home before you get stuck. All right. Here's the third one. Answered prayer is the result of a confident heart and a bold approach. Not so much just the sovereignty of God in him choosing. That's, you know, I'm sure there's that side to it. But look over here at 1 John, and we're just about done. 1 John 3. It says, verse 19, Hereby we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. For if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and he knows all things. Beloved, if our heart condemns us not, then we have confidence towards God. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him. Because, everybody say because. Because we keep his commandments. Because we do those things that are pleasing in his sight. How can we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight and have a confident heart in prayer, if we don't know the book, if we don't have a prayer life, if we don't go to church consistently, how can we know? God is saying, I want you to develop a deep relationship with me through prayer and through the word so you could know. And, and, and when you know what, I, what pleases me and you know what my commandments are and you keep them even though your flesh rebels against them and you choose to do what's right, then your prayers will be answered and whatever you receive, whatever you desire, it'll be given to you because you listen to me and now I'm listening to you. You know what? Here about a year ago, we went to a conference with 
Dave Williams, Pastor Dave Williams, built Mount Hope Church, church of four or 5,000. And uh, he talked about setting faith goals. And he says, you can't have any faith goals unless you start, first start, one of the first steps is start writing your dreams. Writing your dreams every day. Just write your dreams. What's the desires of your heart? And because of certain religious things inside of me, you know, I'm always thinking, well, you know, it's not about me. I don't need to do that. Julie did it. After about three, four weeks, she started coming to me. She was so excited. Ron, I've been writing my dreams and my goals and my desires. And look, this came to pass, and this came to pass, and this came to pass. I uh, thought, really? Maybe I should do that too. Yeah, yeah, and look at this. Look at this one. This one came to pass. This. So I started doing it. And you know what I found out? I found out that God was eager to meet the desires and the dreams of his obedient servants. He loves you. He he told us, you know, um, Pastor Williams, Dave Williams, he had this expensive car. It was Pearl, and it was some, I think it was a Mercedes or something, but it was a dream car. And he says, as a pastor, I would never buy a car like that. Never. But he said, I just like fine automobiles. And of course, I wouldn't buy a brand new car, but I could dream about it, so I put it in my dream book. And I didn't even show it to my wife, and I would pray about it. I would think about it, and I'd say, God, first of all, prayer, God, I want to know you. I want to know your word. I want to obey you. I want to lay down my life for your purposes, whatever that is. How many know that's the prerequisite? And then secondly, he says, God, you have said that you would answer my prayers. And this is a secret petition of my heart. He says, year after year went on, two or three years after he put it in his dream book, Eventually here, about uh, a year and a half ago, two years ago, he, he resigned his church and he went into a different type of ministry. And they were getting together all the, the uh, final arrangements for his farewell. They had a big dinner for him after church. And he saw something over there in the corner that was under a sheet. And he said, Pastor, we want to give you a special gift. You've been here 30 some years. We want to bless you. They pulled off the sheet, and there was that exact car that was in his dream book. How many know God's a good God? You say, I wouldn't want a car like that. Well, what do you want? What's in your heart? Do, do you see that this is relationship? Do you see it's, it's not just about meeting God's requirements and commandments? The only reason God has requirements and commandments is because he loves us, and he knows what works. Amen? But he wants us to fall in love with him and know him and worship him. And we're all in with him in prayer and knowing his ways and knowing his word. And then he opens his arms wide and he says, what do you want? I love you. I created you with certain dreams and desires. Go for it. Dream it. Believe it. Ask, and you shall receive, that your joy may be full. God wants you to live the abundant life. Hallelujah. I don't know. When I see you, Roberta, I just get happy. When I see you and Carlos together, what a great man God gave you. You you had that dream in your heart for a long time, didn't you? And all of a sudden, here comes Carlos, a prince in shining armor. What a beautiful couple. They serve the Lord together. They're passionate about Jesus. I say, yay, God. You say, what what is it? If God could do anything, what would you want him to do for you? That's a good question, isn't it? Why not dream? Why not believe? Maybe it won't happen tomorrow or next week or next month. But why not believe God for his best? We only live once. I want us to stand. Praise the Lord. Growth track.